Hi, this is Mike Ross, public address announcer for your Toronto Maple Leafs, and this is the Leafs Late Night Podcast, your post-game destination. And now, your starting lineup, Roscoe, the Fanalist, Subby, Beaner, and Darty Brodeur on the Leafs Late Night Podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back. It's been a minute, but uh, here we are. Leafs Late Night, I'm Mr. Roscoe, represented by Inside the Brink. I'm here with uh, Steph, the Fanalist, Darty Brodeur. How is it going, my friend? It's been a while, hey? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you you had your adventure at Toronto. How about we start with you? How was that whole sh- shebang, meeting everybody and getting to spend time with uh, Leafs Nation? It was really fun. And, you know, I was a little nervous, especially meeting a bunch of people off the internet that <laughs> you, you haven't met before. Um, it's like one big date in a sense, right? But everyone was super nice and there for the same reason, you know, just wanting to connect uh, like minded Leaf fans. So, yeah, it was Uh-oh, nice. We lost Artie. <laughs> uh no but that's that's good to hear i mean um i don't know if everybody wants to be named but were there any anybody from our our audience that you met when you were out there or from our twitter verse man there were uh people that i knew of before and those that i've never heard of and we just followed the same people so um too many to name, honestly. Um, I'd have to write down a list, but I highly recommend if anyone's in the area to talk to Jeremy, uh, who runs these little meetups. Uh, last one was done by Holly, but um, Jeremy has three more planned, and it's honestly a great night to just go out and ha- have a couple beers or not if you don't drink and watch the game with other people who just want to watch the Leaf game, you know? Yeah, and uh, that kind of extends to, if anybody in the Ottawa area, I know I've realized over the last couple of weeks that I'm not the only one, like, and Andrew as well, um, that are, you know, in the Leafs Twitterverse that are in Ottawa. So if anybody wants to link up for any of the two games, either the March, what is it, 18th and April 1st, I think, are the two games. They're a couple weeks apart. Um, I have tickets to both of them. So if anybody's going and wants to... uh, Say hi or meet up before the game. You know, shoot me a message on Twitter, and we can do the same. Ottawa Leaf fans, let's let's band together. Yeah, no, it's super fun. Uh, Julian Aubrey off Twitter is coming down from the UK in March, so one of those meetups. He he will be there, and honestly, like meeting Curtis from Alberta, that was awesome. This guy is a real life gem. Um, can't say That's nothing, awesome. but great things about him honestly and even holly on anyone on leaf's twitter uh no bag heads heads were there but all of the good ones so highly recommend it nice and uh daddy bro dare how you been daddy bro (laughs) you always got a good one for me i've been good i've been good um um, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't been catching too many Leafs games. I know this is what we do, but I've said it once and I'll say it again. This is the worst thing about um, being me. And I'm sure a lot of people feel this way about the uh, how they, you know, I'm not the only Leafs fan that's like this, is that I already know how this story ends per se. So these games are meaningless to me. I'm sorry, but there's a lot of meaning people are pulling out of them. But you and I both know that we're going to the first round. All right. I'm not fucking jinxing anybody here. We've been there. Unless something catastrophic happens. We've been great. We've been fucking phenomenal. So I said, these games are pointless. Like get me to the fucking first round and show me a win. So I, I'm sorry to all the fans at home who are like, wow, Darty, you have not brought any great content or, or, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing good here. You've added no value to this. Yeah. Well, because this is a valueless season until we, like, you know, the regular season is, is is meaningless. Show me the fucking money, right? Show me the meat. So I might not be as um, vocal about certain things unless, God forbid, something crazy happens. And you know, some of the, you know some of these games are are wild per se, but they're not like you know they're not mind blowing because the Leafs haven't been on a big like that's the point I was going to make before, but I'll stop. I'll save it for later. But like Leafs have still have been doing pretty pretty good, you know, pretty good. So pretty 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 good. So um, that explains it's... why we have a bunch of complaints in the complaint department, RDA, because you're not believing lately <laughs> or not watching or what? Because I got a couple emails with your name on it. Uh-oh. And 
Uh oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say letters to the editor. Stuff like that. <laughs> that dirty guy, he's gotta go. What a bum. Nah, missed yeah. <laughs> no, and I think that's a good segue into um I didn't really have an order that we could talk about these, but I think it's a good good little transition. Uh there were some numbers released, I don't have them in front of me, but uh that the ratings are quite down in the States. And um one of the reasons that people have been bringing up is exactly what Darty said, is that because of the format that we've had uh, for the playoffs, everybody knows who's playing who, especially here in Leafs Nation. Like, we know that we're playing Tampa in the first round unless something drastic happens, which, I mean, the deadline will see what team uh, really swings for the fences. But judging by what's going on right now, things are going to stay as is. So it's hard to really care about, you know, the second half of the season. Like, really, since game... You know, thirty to forty, we've we've pretty much known that they're going to play Tampa. So I think it's hard to watch these games, especially you know with the bye week and the All Star game. Like people can easily forget that this is going on and kind of get out of the the swing of watching hockey until the playoffs come around. So I think it's totally understandable. Uh, what do you guys think on that? Well, you know, I have All Star fresh in my mind and this break, but at the same time. It's kind of nice having a little break before we get right into it. This last push before the playoffs, like this last, you know, I'm hoping for a lot of players to come out and pull strong. And for example, I don't know, like Colorado, who's supposed to be making this huge push because they're, they haven't been doing so well thus far. And maybe I'm going a little bit off topic, but. Well, I mean, it, <clears throat> let's just look at teams that were good last year. I mean, Calgary and Colorado and Florida, they're all kind of underperforming this year. The Rangers are underperforming. I mean, Washington and Pittsburgh are kind of in the same boat. The only real Cinderella story this year has been Boston. Uh, Leafs are kind of flying the same place they were last year, and so are Tampa. So it's a lot of those stronger small markets and medium-sized markets that whose teams have fallen off this year that, you know, at this point, they're like, well, we can pack it in because at this point, it's it's kind of a lock or we're fighting for a wild card spot. So it really depends on the market that you're in. But I feel like a lot of people have kind of packed it in until the playoffs just because of the format, which, I mean, Batman brought up at the All-Star game. He was asked about it. Um, and he said, you know, it's, what was the quote? It, it's like not worth changing, basically. Well, what, Sidney what Crosby idiot. says he wishes, you know, to change the format. Sid the Kid, who are you going to listen to in this league? Ovi, Sid, McD, all Here, these up. superstars. I don't know. says NHL has no plans to change playoff format. The debate about one versus eight, it's not just that. You have to look at changes to the wild card and start looking at the matchup in terms of how many teams play each other. If you're having conference-based playoffs, it's not as simple as saying, I'd like one versus eight uh, versus what we have. It involves a whole host of other issues that have to be addressed. Except it doesn't because you just changed it to this from that <laughs> a few years ago. So you can't just make up, well, there's a whole list of issues that come with that. Because there aren't. We know there aren't. Just change it. Yeah, there's one like, issue. Is that Batman is still a fucking commissioner, right? The guy's a bum. The, it's, he's like, he, <laughs> I would rather have Peros as head of the uh, NHL because at least that would keep things interesting, all right? There, I mean, <laughs> it's time for some young blood. Val, put fucking torts, you know? Like, it's getting rid to the point where Gary is boring. I don't want to fucking know about Gary Bettman. I don't want to hear about Gary Bettman. I don't ever want to see Gary Bettman. I'm sure he's a great guy. He's good to his family. Who knows? I don't care. I'm sick and tired about hearing about commissioners of a goddamn sport. I want to know about the players. And quite frankly, we're talking about the NHL art all-star game. We all know that these are loss leaders. I'm like the biggest fucking football fan. I've never seen a Pro Bowl once in my life. Not only do I not have time to see a meaningless game, but... It's for kids. It's for people to get in there and become fans of the sport, all right? It's not for us who, who are already here who, like, love it. I know what Austin Matthews can, can do. I know what Connor McDavid can do. These are meaningless games. This is very, very obviously, I said, they've always been a loss leader. But with this sport right now, the way hockey's going, this, like, Batman's either got to go or he's got to do some radical changes because said you know there was nothing but vitriol and hate for this all-star game it's very clear that the fucking stars don't want to be there like 
they've got to figure something out fast because if you don't have the stars there, who the hell are the kids going to see? All right. Cause I'm not watching the game. Sorry. I'm not that, bi- I'm not big enough a fan to watch a fucking all-star game, especially when I know that my team is going to be in the first round and likely get fleeced again. All right. So just to draw off of that before, <laughs> before getting into the all-star game, no, it's, it's totally, totally valid. Uh, but mm-hmm. to, to draw off the Batman thing, the other side that I've heard um, is the reason for ratings being down is ratings only account for people that are watching the game on TV, on cable, through legal means. And because of Mr. Uh, Happy 30th Anniversary Gary Bettman, uh, that is becoming increasingly hard every season, especially for people like me who don't live in the market where you're allowed to watch your team. So the more people move online to stream as games become less accessible, as prices go up for Sportsnet Plus and TSN Plus, or whatever they're called, Sportsnet Now, um, I mean, for me to just get the two of those to get the out of market games, which is, I think, more than half the season, it would be about six hundred dollars. So it's it's becoming less accessible. So people are moving to streaming it online like the pirates that we are. And Oy. that causes the ratings to go down. And I mean, it's it looks bad to advertisers because you're you're just making it hard for people to watch the thing that they're trying to watch. And I, if we learned anything from streaming it's that like look me myself as somebody that used to pirate movies and tv shows when i was you know what we're talking like 10 years ago when things were not on netflix like you know there was a handful of things up there but it was always like oh canadian netflix sucks this is way back before they're pretty much the same now um now all netflix like i would pirate things because they weren't accessible if you give people legal means to access something within the the services they already subscribe to they will use those legal paid for services to watch your product but if you make it hard people are going to go well it's a lot easier to just go to whatever.com or dot whatever country and watch the game there instead of paying for it on some other service because honestly the last thing people need right now is another service to pay for like everybody's monthly subscriptions are adding up and it's just it's something that we don't need so if people really want the numbers to go up with the NHL and these markets to thrive, all they need to do is make the games more accessible to watch. And again, unfortunately this, I don't like to keep talking about him and throwing him under the bus, but this falls on Bettman again. Like he's just made it harder and harder for people to watch their own team. And then he complains that, Oh, we can't get these small markets going. Well, you know, maybe there's people outside of, of Minnesota or Seattle or Vegas that want to watch that team, but you're not giving them a fair chance to. Yep, uh, I think his time is up. Honestly, I don't know how this league is going to be rid of Batman, but every time I think of him addressing the media or just shaking there, and I know he has a, a medical problem, but just how his look on his face—it looks like he's going to flip his lid, and you know, steam's going to come out of his ears because he only believes what he knows, and like. You can give him all the stats and it doesn't seem to work out. But for example, even today, finding out that Connor Bedard (laughs) telling TSN that Mason McTavish sends him a text every time the Ducks lose and they talk about wanting to, you know, how much they look forward and wanting to play with each other in the NHL. Meanwhile, Bettman is convinced that nobody, it's impossible to tank, right? Like, this is an impossible theory, no way in hell, and, like, we're seeing shit like this on the news. Come on! Like, what do we need? The actual text messages? It's going to be a back and forth every other night, duck schedule, like, can't wait to see you, bud. Can't wait to live with you next year. At the end of this contract, he'll have been in charge for 34 years. I I cannot think of another person, like anybody who's in charge of anything for that long, besides like, you know, major corporations where there's some family that runs it. But like, that's not what this is. Like anything where somebody is, I don't know, when you have someone in charge of any form of entertainment, you need to rotate who's in charge or it's going to get stale. People are going to fall behind. And look, all we've seen over the last 20 years is the NHL fall behind. It's, you know, the most embarrassing thing that I keep seeing on Instagram, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but they keep posting uh, on Sportsnet and and TSN, these basketball players walking into games wearing NHL gear. And all the comments are like, how much is the NHL paying you to have 
players that if, are from a league that's making money advertise your brand. <laughs> like, it's so obvious. These guys are just walking in wearing, like, a jersey of, like, a Calgary Flames jersey. Like, give, tell me they fucking know what team they're wearing <laughs> or they've ever seen that before or could name one player on the Flames at any time. Like, they don't care. And it, it it's just, it's embarrassing. It's it's embarrassing to to feel like the sport that we're watching is just slipping in popularity. And when, you know, we're, oh, it's Canada's sport. And, you know, the, the government's all on protecting uh, Canadian content and all this shit. But, like, they've done nothing to stop the NHL from putting up these barriers for Canadian markets. Like, honestly, just to go off on it, I know I've been ranting, but to go off on a little bit of a tangent, there's a huge thing going on with this Bill C-11 for Canada, like, interfering with, you know, the Internet and getting in, involved with uh, how Canadian content's displayed on YouTube and all this stuff. I don't understand why they haven't interfered if they're going to interfere in anything to make a Canadian cultural entertainment form accessible to all Canadians. They haven't interfered with the NHL and said, look, you can't put up these, these regional blackout restrictions. Like this is the country's sport. You cannot restrict people from watching other teams in this country. Like that's, that's silly. We want to grow this game, not diminish it. Amen. So if if Trudeau and the CRTC and the Heritage Committee want to get involved in anything, get involved in the NHL instead of YouTube that has literally – there's no reason to do that. End quote. Mike, I'm done. <laughs> you guys sign on that stuff? No. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, I Honestly, the dream, right? One price, unlimited access to – all NHL content. Honestly, if we had the right, you know how much money you can make? Like if you had the option of having, you know, if you have the Leafs app, you can see interviews, you can see specifics to the team and their schedule and fan related things. If you can get this all compiled on a singular app for every single team, man, that would be your, your goal is to click to get all of your info in one place. That's the goal of these social media platforms to be on one platform for all of your needs and to interact the most on one site. If the NHL wants to go further, man, look into this, follow what um, the TFC did with the Apple contract, right? And, um, you know, Apple users can watch unlimited soccer. So I don't know. It's, uh, a crazy know, idea so when when the contract with rogers runs out keep the rights yourself you know like i uh, no i guess they have to sell the because that's where a ton of the revenue comes from is selling it but maybe an alternative is the nhl just sets up their own subscription like you have the nhl app and you can just watch whatever game is on and like they have their own service like i i don't know i'm kind of getting back to my own point but go ahead dirty there's so much information and just knowledge and, and, and opinions that are passed that I kind of don't want to stomp too much on it. But what I would like to say is that it's just, it's like Gary Bettman's not even cool. You know, like, again, like, <laughs> <laughs> like at least Vince McMahon, like I'm actually like, I mean, I'm I, like, <laughs> I don't even watch WWE, but if I do like, you know, he's there, he's their commissioner, right? At least he makes a, not anymore. No, I'm just saying, like he was there for a long time, right? His family, like, oh, you know, it's always been a big part of okay, it. Okay, you, you do just, just an aside. You do know what happened there, right? I, I I'm again, I, I know, but I don't know. But what I do know, is, okay, we can get to it what after. I do. What I do know is that at least he's fucking interesting, regardless of what happened. Like, if he's out there doing his like, <laughs> you know, his ooh, you know, like at least that's like instead of Gary's like sourpuss face, like, aha, very funny. You guys are all booing me. Why are you booing me? The NHL is great, and you're asking for problems that don't exist. I'm Gary <laughs> Bettman. Like, holy shit. Like, that is not why I watch hockey. That's not why I watch hockey, all right? I don't watch hockey for, you know, John Travolta-isms, you know? <laughs> okay, you make a good point that McMahon was present, and you could tell that he watched the sport. Mm -hmm. The complaint that is totally valid of Batman is he clearly doesn't watch this, or he would... Like, anybody that was in charge of how this game is broadcast, and how any of these major events are broadcast, would be like, wait, what the fuck are we doing? But, an aside, Vince McMahon was ousted because he was having a relationship with one of his staff members. Um, he's also married, so they outed him, 
and they were like, it was one of those things like Trump where he's like, oh, it's going to a trust and they handed control over to his wife and they're like, that's not good enough. So they took it away from the whole family and now somebody else is in charge. If Gary and, uh, Bettman had a tryst, well. that would be the most interesting thing that has ever happened to the NHL. <laughs> all right. <laughs> in regards to fucking, in, in regards to the upper management, all right. That would actually, honestly, that would make me respect him more just because the guy is literally they, they, there is wallpaper paste that is significantly more interesting than Gary Bettman. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not out here like praising adultery. What I am praising though, is the fact that the guy is simply boring and I'm sick and tired of, you know, I'm here to watch the sport. I'm here to watch guys beat the shit of each other, play good hockey and fucking score goals. I don't care about some aging Mr. Burns plump man <laughs> being annoying and being annoyed <laughs> by us that doesn't fucking make me care about our sport it's enough and that's the point i was trying to get back to is that why do we think that there's a big fucking thing about harold ballard that came out recently because i think deep down the people are getting annoyed the upper management all uh, and across the league not every not every team's like this but across the league is starting to fucking you know get, get complacent and line their pockets and they don't care anymore they ha gary bettman has put them in the school of ballard and there are at least 60 percent of the teams who are very happy being mediocre because they are still getting paid and fun fact that's not going to grow the game it might grow their wallets it might buy them yachts but it's not growing the game it's not helping push people to want to play the goddamn sport so and it's not opening up barriers as much as hockey can, can, claims to be about you know diversity and caring about players of all backgrounds they don't give a crap i'm sitting here today today telling you that if they actually cared then guys like fucking aquilini guys like the fucking management in the philadelphia flyers would be up in arms trying to oust Gary Bettman and start fucking pumping money to where it matters instead of just lying in their fat pockets because there are fucking thousands, millions of dollars to be made if they actually gave a shit. Honestly, and the, the people that are at the top of the executive committee, the, uh, uh, oh, who is it? Um, the ones that own the uh, Blackhawks, the Wirtz family, they, uh, Honestly, with the with the state that the Blackhawks are in, they should be pretty vocal right now. To, I mean, like the the attendance is down there. The team's falling apart. Like they're, I don't know. They should be they should be on the side of finding a new commissioner. Anyway, I do want to transition from this into the All Star Game while we're talking about <laughs> some things that aren't really working. And uh, I want to start with reading this breakdown here. We can go piece by piece through this. This is from friend of the show from uh, Down Under, Lucas Hainsworth. Okay. So. Um, first off, so I watched pretty much every minute of the NHL All-Stars Skills Evening. These are the things that he liked. So, OV Jr., saw that, that was cute, uh, but also super lame. It's not, like, when you... <sighs> okay, when you see OV and Crosby on the ice together at the All-Star game for, like, the first time ever for this breakaway challenge, I don't want to see them pass it to a toddler and have him just push it in the net. It's like, I wanted to see something cool. But, like, it was cute. I don't know. Uh, Dunk Tank needed ice. P.K. Subban, Miami Vice Marner. Um, reverse Retros, Cosby beating McJesus. McCarr Stylish Fail. And Pitch and Puck. I watched this. I was actually surprised at how entertaining the golf hockey thing was. I didn't think it was going to be, like... I didn't think they were going to be able to get the shots off that they did. I, I don't know why, but I thought it would be a lot harder to shoot a, a puck. Like, I don't know. You don't think about outside of the context of a rink, like how far these guys can shoot. So when you put that onto a golf course, it was like, Oh, huh. That's kind of, that's kind of entertaining. Did you guys get the chance to see it? Yeah. Um, I actually really enjoyed that as well. Uh, it's so interesting. Like you said, it's nice that they uh, carried the little pad with them as they took each shot and then actually used the stick to put the golf ball into the hole. But um I don't know. This is like the definition of sauce. And when you were watching this segment, all these commentators were saying was like, ooh, extra sauce, perfect sauce. The sauce was this. Like, A little mustard on that. <laughs> yeah. um, I felt so bad for Ro Robertson there, <laughs> who immediately called mercy after his first or second shot. But I guess the, the whole point of this that was like the what the fuck moment was when... The prize was 
a year's worth of Chipotle, and the winner won it where Chipotle's not even in Quebec. Womp, womp. Nick Suzuki can't even access Chipotle. <laughs> well, if he comes over right across the border to the Rito Center, there's one there. So he can come like an hour and a half to one. Okay, not too far. <laughs> but still, I thought, I was like, wow. That's pretty funny. I can't believe they don't sponsor in Quebec because there's obviously one in Toronto as well and um, other locations. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it overall as a game, it was interesting. You know, it's Florida. So, you know, you got to show some golf. Um, I think it worked. I didn't watch more than one whole of it, though. So I don't know how much the entertainment keeps up. Like, I mean, I can't watch a whole day of golf. So I don't know if I could watch a whole day of people, of hockey players playing golf. So uh, before we move on, is there anything that you guys liked about uh, what you saw of All-Star, uh, I guess, weekend, Friday, Thursday and Friday? I appreciated that they went with the reverse retros, right? Like we complain yeah. all year that we don't see enough of them. So this is the perfect time to bring them out and showcase them, right? And yeah, um, I agree. You know, I thought we were getting the whole frozen meat puck situation. That was the rumor with the alligators, <laughs> like tossed. The I, I don't know how that was going to happen. So I guess we got the surfboard thing or the the puck or the golf thing which man I, I don't know i feel like they elongated everything i felt like yeah. it could have been shortened kept sweet but everyone was just standing around and yada yada and the players didn't look very interested oh my god no there was uh i think it was the hardest shot competition when they were introducing all the players i saw that one i caught bits and pieces of this but they were going down the line and I have never seen a more disinterested group of people in my life. Like while they're calling their names out, it was just <laughs> insane, man. Like just deadpan. And I mean, there's people that, I get there weren't a ton of people there, but like there's people there to watch you at least put something on for the few people that did show up. I don't know. It just, it was kind of sad, uh, but I do agree that the reverse retros were a nice touch, especially because the, uh, the actual East and West jerseys were, uh, a shout out to the 90s ones so it was cool and i like how they incorporated the beach and like when you think of florida what do you think of beach and golf and that's exactly what they did um something okay. we've I never think of a couple <laughs> other things with florida but okay disney world yeah right, Moscow? we're trying to keep it positive okay <laughs> yeah disney world <laughs> but for sunrise and i was speaking with a tampa fan and talking about you know how some of the seats weren't filled and next year we're getting it in toronto right so okay look they... i've been to the panther stadium it is equivalent to the ottawa senator stadium it's in the middle of an like if look, pull it up on a map it's like on an island essentially it's surrounded by a massive parking lot for like forty five thousand cars it's mm -hmm. insane it is insane it is the least accessible yeah so that was their argument. Um, if the arena was more success accessible and if the competition was actually on the Saturday, Sunday, instead of Friday, Saturday, maybe the attendance rate would have been higher. And immediately that's what I thought of the Ottawa Senators and how you guys always explain to me, it's such a bitch to get there. You can't get there easily from downtown Ottawa. You can't go anywhere to drink beforehand. Like it's just in this industrial area, not even in Ottawa apparently. And down there, it's sort of the same thing. And it's not a hockey city. I mean, I was in Orlando in November. People didn't even seem like they knew what hockey was. <laughs> like, I don't know. I saw one Snowbird fan that was from Montreal and one girl mistaken my ID for Ohio and started chirping me with like a bunch of football references. And I'm like, no, it says Ontario. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Can you guys see the screen that I just shared? Yes. Look at this. Okay. So here's here's their, their stadium. Look at this parking lot. Whoa. It is I'm, Disney World. I'm not kidding. Lot. This is the biggest parking lot I've ever seen. Like I went there a couple of years ago with my dad and it's it's like a 15 minute walk from either end of this thing. It's like going to a university. Do you share the Canada. arena with anybody or? But then um, I'm not sure who else. Well, um, hosting, this says hosting music performances plus Florida Panthers. Guaranteed the music so I think performances it's only sell this. out more than the Panthers games. <laughs> and it's called 
the the yeah the good store is panther land so it looks like it's only panthers games but look at this when i zoom out so it's essentially it's it's kind of on an island like it's surrounded by water you have to take a bridge to get in there but look at this it's beside the everglades oh nice <laughs> like whoa this is all just this is an island of a mall and like all these little lakes and shit like there's nobody lives imagine, around here. imagine like the you know the senators built their stadium and like adjacent to it was algonquin park <laughs> that's like, literally what it looks like this is nuts and wow. it's like look, there's fort lauderdale like look how far away from the beach and the water it is mm -hmm. if you wanted to put a, a team out here why not put them near the beach so that you can attract people that maybe wouldn't be hockey fans to come to the, like why if you're gonna put it in sunrise what I, I just don't get this i don't know man this is stupid it's like the farthest away uh no. anyway yeah so that's a question for you johnny i brought this up in the group chat were you guys aware that that they had a mascot named victory rat <laughs> <laughs> what? He was that. getting just absolutely pummeled by this guy. Apparently, some, uh, some Tampa—I'm sure it's a setup—but some Tampa fan was was really prickly, and he uh, he jerseyed and was like like beating up the mascot, and they just people let it happen. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, they just like, let well, it looking happen. Looking at it, I'm like, who the f I'm like, this is—I could swear they had a different mascot. I would have thought that they had a mascot that was like a panther. But yeah, I was like, and then I'm looking at it again, like his name is Victor E. Rat. I was like, I was like, look, there's already Victor E. Green, okay, and he's stupid. That's <laughs> Victor <crazy>. E. Rat. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so uh, next tweet of this chain from Lucas: things that I think need reworking slash close to, but not 100. percent uh, the Tendy Tandem, good idea, but better execution. Speed skating, bring a specialist wild card. Every event needs a wild card competitor, Zegris, etc. Pat Maroon has potential, but not media ready yet. So the thing on the, <laughs> the specialist wild card, I, I like that because there's people that could potentially be good at one thing, you know, like we're bringing all stars because they're all around good at everything, but they might not be the best at one thing, right? So... I think it'd be cool to, you know, have a nominee from around the league. Like, like the players get to vote somebody in. Like, who do you guys think is the fastest person? And I, and whoever the players unanimously vote in gets to join for that competition. Like, maybe ask the goalies. Like, who outside of the All Stars is an absolute snipe show, or who has the hardest shot from like goalies and defensemen? And mm. then ask everyone who's the fastest and add those people in. I think that'd be interesting. Yeah. And, you know, everyone has a bunch of recommendations. And since we were talking about mascots, you know, there's so much wait time between each event. I can't even imagine being a ticket holder to one of these weekends must feel like. Why not do a mascot thing? Like challenge the mascots in a in a race or like a freaking obstacle course or whatever and have some in-between entertainment. The mascots had all of their own events, but they didn't do them like... They should use those to separate everything instead of having like jumping around between stuff and like pre-recorded things. Like, just have the mascots come out and and have you know different rounds of dodgeball in between setting up for different events. Like, there's things that you can do to entertain the people that are there that you can also broadcast. I think the thing that they forget is that there's two groups that they have to keep locked in and entertained all day, and that's the people that are physically there and the people that are watching this at home. And those are two different things. Like you have to have enough going on that people there can go to different events, but you have to also have stuff that, that translates to on camera. And I think that's where they fail here is they just, they can't make something that translates to both groups. So how do you guys feel about <clears throat> keeping all of the events in the arena then? Like if it's going to be so much of a confusion or a bust in a sense, why not stick it to old school and keep it in the arena? What do you guys think about that? Darty, you want to take feel like first? you like they, they really have to focus on what they've been doing right and just cut the crap too, right? Because like I don't know, there's just something about looking back at those old All Star games and like how cool they were with. Uh, with Gretzky and, and, you know, Lemieux and all that. It's like what, like those, those all-star games seem to be like, they were actually like big events. And now it's just kind of like, 
almost too cornball in a way. And uh, you got to, you really have to sell it to the fucking players to be there too. Right. Like it just, you were mentioning that they, they really just didn't seem like too involved. Like this is the, like we're always complaining about, about the players not having enough personality or not really showing, showing their personality. Well, this is a, this is the point where we, you know, you got to get their, you got to call their agent and say, look, like we need these guys to be as goofy and as funny as possible. Like if you got to give them a Red Bull or something before, just do it because they, it's not just <laughs> like, it's not just about, we get it. These guys get a massive paycheck. They're great players. You know what? We can't really force them to do anything. Well, it's the one day of the year that you got to sell your sport to everybody to earn the salary and continue earning the salary for yourself and the rest of the league. Don't be boring. God damn it. Don't be boring. All right. There's some good moments though. I like the little exchange between the, uh, is it Brady Kachuk and, uh, and Marner there? <laughs> Is uh, it's just, it's just, yeah. They just really, honestly, like everybody needs to take, like, like everybody that's involved needs to make sure that this is not just a boring event. And I think we have, we're at a point now where we talk about like players, you know, how like LeBron James is like very involved in the direction of, of their league, right? Well, you need these players to be accountable and step up to to also part- not just participate, but you know. We always we're complaining about Gary Bettman, but who organized the All Star Game, right? If the if the players really want to be involved, and maybe it's again, it's, it seems like it's totally upper management that's, that's that's failing failing on this too. You need to get if you want the players to be involved, involve the players. All right, it's their game too. It's their sport. Get them. You know, I think those guys know better than anything because they've been watching it just like us. What will fucking make them happy and everybody else happy? Would you not agree with that? Hundred percent. That's what I mean about like having the players vote each other into the All Star game instead of like I get the fan vote, but you're just opening the door for a you know just meme people. You know, you know what I mean. Just people voting dumb people in, and then they're just going to ignore it. And and then why did you have a fan vote anyway? Or like this year where they have a fan vote, and then they're just like, yeah, it's a suggestion. Have the players vote each other in. But like pick the all star like one from each team, and then the other ones have the players pick who should join them. You know, because they have the the pulse on who's the best in the league, right? So then you'll get some interesting picks. The other thing that would be interesting is have like two celebrities come in and do like fantasy draft and pick the teams to go against each other because they might not even be that good, but they're the best players, yeah. so it can't be that bad. But it's like you put weird combinations of people together where it's like somebody that would that watches hockey every day would be like, oh, my God, Snoop Dogg, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> don't put those people together. Those guys hate each other. Like, it'd be so yeah. funny. Honestly, one of my recommendations was going to be, you know, bring back the all-star fantasy draft. They used to have this where the captains and the alternates picked players yeah. from any you know, East or West. And then you saw teams get formed from both sides. But originally I asked you guys about, you know, keeping it in the arena because the AHL had their all-star events right after the NHL. And, you know, a lot of talk on Twitter, people were like, this is what we wanted to watch sort of thing. They saw skills. They saw Joseph Wall take the top honors for uh, goaltenders. And also a big thing um, was that they took down the half wall class so that fans could interact with the players while That's all really of the cool. events. Yeah. while well, it happened. I've never seen that happen before. That is a really, really cool thing that they did. So yeah, sorry, your your original question was about keeping it in the arena. And I think, yes, Asterix, if you're in somewhere like Florida, you kind of have to take advantage of the fact that it is nice out in February and nowhere else has that advantage. Like it is something yeah. that's unique to Florida and the, the California teams and, you know, some of the others like to, um, uh, Texas and or Dallas, but uh normally, yeah, I would say keep everything in the arena because then, like I said, if you're trying to do a fan experience for the people that are there, you can't have people moving around or feel like they bought a ticket to part of the event. Like, you know, that's how you lose out on people attending things, right? Like if people said, well, I'm going to go to the the beach thing or the golf thing, but I'm not going to go to the skills competition stuff like in the arena. So then maybe if all of those things were in the arena, it would have been full, but instead you spread everybody out. It's the same thing I say, shout out Ottawa for, about Blues Fest. 
where they instead of doing like a country day a rock day and a hip-hop day they spread one artist out on each day hoping that you're going to buy 10 tickets but instead people just buy one and you have a bunch of empty days so it's it works in theory but in practice that's a really bad idea so yeah, yeah i think they should put everything in the arena they should go back to five on five because three on three i get that it's fun but like Let's let's show some real hockey here. Like, you know, you got the best guys. Let's let's show some cool some cool shit. Like I get three on three, you get the space, you can do fun things, but like let's recreate why these guys are the best. Have them go against each other, see a cool game, maybe do like shortened periods, switch out the goalies like they used to do. And then uh, and then go to skills competitions and expand them instead of just having fastest skate or hardest shot and shoot the targets. Like have some some other things that incorporate where you are or I don't know. I just, there's so much room to, to cut crap out of this, like Darty said. Hey, Beaner. Welcome to the show. Hey, everyone. Sorry. Had some uh, difficulties locating my cord. Excuses. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth, though. Um, quickly on what you were saying there, Johnny. Um, I completely agree they need to basically get back to basics with the all-star yeah. game go back to five on five you need to get the actual competitions in there that involve skill and if you want to do something fun or something quirky go ahead like i i want to say it was oh seven or somewhere in there they had like a goalie fastest skater or something like something silly like that right i like Create that. some some fun ones like that but then you want to keep the originals hardest shot, everything, but I don't care if they're an all-star. I don't care if they're a fourth line plug. If they've got the hardest shot, invite them for the hardest shot competition. Well, that's what, I don't know if you heard my point earlier, but I was saying, cause Lucas uh, brought up that they should have like a wild card for each of these events. And I was saying that the players should nominate, you know, who they think is the fastest and who they think has the hardest shot and all that. So that those people get into the competition as well as the all-stars so they can show off, you know, I'm, McDavid may be the best all around, but haha, I am a little bit faster than him. Yeah. Like I want to see a fastest skater final of McKinnon versus McDavid. Like that would be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a, a good idea I saw online as well. Um, you want to keep the crowd entertained. You want to keep the players, you know, giving their undivided attention. Why not give them a little prize fund for MVP? of the all-star weekend in the game, as well as making, you know, uh, arc arcade style rules in a sense. For example, during the game, maybe a certain period of time, a goal's worth two points or like you switch <laughs> out, like just to make it interesting, like things you wouldn't see in a regular season, but just to encourage the players to, you know, not hurt themselves, but give a little effort because we are paying fans here we are looking forward to to these these nights so i don't know it's just an idea you're laughing at me it's fine no i think it'd be funny like a sign goes up it says like offsides and icing are now allowed and then like the sign comes down another one comes up this is uh back passing no longer allowed it's like oh shit <laughs> like having them adjust on the fly like oh oh no, no oh pass. no <laughs> that'd be kind of fun to watch yeah like no two line passing for the next 30 seconds, a goal is worth this many points. Like, just to keep it in the game. Like, they're still fucking around. It's for the kids and whatever. Well, but to play defense. <laughs> it'd be really... F yeah, yeah. I was, was going to say, like, how would you get the goalies out? Like, goalies can't be in the crease. Right? Trapezoid rules are now out the window. <laughs> or most goalie goals from the opposite goal line. Like trying to shoot it in the nets or, or anything. Like just only defensemen little... are allowed to cross the center line. <laughs> I don't know, just to keep it entertaining and yeah. or even put even yeah. put like McDavid and McKinnon in net and have like been, have like oh, no. Bennington and fucking uh, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and like Freddie oh, Anderson an face idea. off against each other or something. That'd be <laughs> have the goalies come down and try to take shots yeah. on players. That'd be funny. Or um, only, <clears throat> excuse me, actual trick shots only. Yeah, like, none of this, none of this bullshit. Like you know, gimmicky. It's just for show. It's you know, little nod of the hat kind of deal. Like 
let's let's see some cool stuff especially since things are ramping up skill wise now like players are getting better and better and i feel yeah. like the skills competition is getting boring Ugh. In, okay uh, just one more thing one more thing one more thing uh give them a couple chances if you're gonna do like a skills or a breakaway competition give them like three chances to allow them to try things they wouldn't try during a game or even a regular shootout in an nhl game like just a couple opportunities to get it off and best one anyway that's what they that's yeah, what they do 30, with the, um, the nba on. uh the slam dunk competition don't they they you know they, they rate it and then you get like a couple couple yeah. chances to do it but um, my phone is dying so i'm gonna hand off my uh my color over to to beaner all right so he can uh he can add the add the remaining <laughs> uh hot takes and, and and have you but i'm sure beaner will edify all okay, of you, you better I, I miss his uh his beautiful voice and his uh his positive positivity and, and his wealth of knowledge. All right. So I'm sorry. I couldn't stick around. I said my phone will die and, uh, and then it'll just be shocking and I don't want to shock you guys. So love you all. Thank you. You better get that thing plugged uh, in and finish your upload. I will. I promise. <laughs> Bye <Thank> folks. <laughs> Good to see you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so things that didn't work from Lucas. Uh, lots of standing around waiting. McDavid saying he hated Mickey Mouse. Lack of backing music at outdoor events. Need more niche skilled players. I'm sure there's a faster skater somewhere. And Batman wasn't in the dunk tank. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of what we covered already. Uh, so things that are moving in the right direction. So this is some positives. Ladies competing, big plus there. More diverse faces on TV, love that. Trying new ideas, eh, it's good to try things, even if they don't work, it's good to at least say, well, we tried it and it didn't work. Uh, regeneration of media and people covering sport, great. And fan skills challenge, we should bring the winners to next year's showcase. Mm, that's interesting. That would be nice to see fans involved, you know, um, the top three of all of the videos submitted, for example, and getting the kids involved. Yeah. And um, sorry, Lucas just sent me a message to add on here. Um, he said, if you want to explain as well, because I didn't grow up with hockey, always being available and pervasive, watching the All-Star game was the one time a year when I could see the All-Stars at once. Before the NHL deal with ESPN and NHL TV, it was the only ethnic broadcaster, and we would get random-ass games like Hartford versus New York Islanders or St. Louis versus Philly. So the All-Star game was like a makeup event or a good introduction to new fans. And I kind of liked this year's, especially because the Atlantic killed the others, and Mitch had a great personality for it. So oh. it's a good point that, you know, with all these things we brought up, and kind of to Darty's point, that this is this is where you collect new fans. So you really need to make sure that you're showing off everything that your sport has to offer. Like the point of the all-star game should be, look, this is what the best of the best is on any given night. You can see any of these guys playing, just turn your TV on, switch to one of these games. One of these players will be playing because we have someone from every single team except Seattle. Sorry, Seattle. <laughs> Go ahead, Beaner. Yeah. Like, uh, and can you turn your mic up a bit? Um, Sorry. Is that any better? A little bit. Um, let's go old fashioned here. I'll hold it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, with the All Star Game, I think a lot of the times the biggest complaints are from people who have been fans for the longest time already. That's because a good point. We, we know what this game is. We know what we like in this game, and a lot of times that's not what you get at the All Star Game because the All Star Game is typically geared towards kids, people who don't you know, who aren't watching all the time, people who actually are there live, and then maybe trying to get new fans showing, hey, hockey's fun, and, and it's for everyone, <clears throat> even though it's not. Um, uh -huh. It's not. <laughs> I don't know if you guys touched on that yet or not. Nope. No. Um, but <clears throat> I remember liking the All-Star game a lot more when I was younger, and I don't know if that's just because that's what it's geared towards. Yes, it, it is cool to see some of the things still, but I don't really pay as much attention to it now as I used to, which in a way is a shame. But like Lucas said, it's it's still a very good introduction for people who maybe don't watch all the time. If I had not watched hockey before and I was like, oh, the 2023 All-Star Game is on and I watched that skills competition and that's what I saw of Ovi and Crosby, I'd be like, 
I thought like that's like if me as somebody who doesn't watch soccer was like, oh, Ronaldo and Messi are doing some like challenge thing together for the All Star game, and they like passed it off to their kids, and I was like, oh, well, I thought they were supposed to be like the best in the world. And, like I get it, it's cute, but like I wanted to see them do something because I've never seen it before because I don't watch this game. You know, like it, you have to look at it through that lens and to just to to be devil's advocate to what you said and because we've watched the game so long i feel like we know how we want it represented to new fans like we we know what the best of the best is of this game and what it has to offer and we want to see that represented in a condensed form uh turned up to an 11 with the with all of the best players in one spot and i i feel like they just fall short of that like it it doesn't have that effect like us as hardcore hockey fans should be pumped for this and it just feels like an event that's for nobody like i mean if it's geared at kids they have follow-up boy playing so that's for who like that's for the 30 something year olds and the the 20 somethings to 30 somethings like like follow <laughs> boy I, okay i mean i guess they're making a comeback but it's it's not a name that's like oh my god like the kids are are really getting into follow boy now no so it's uh just, you still exist in golf <laughs> Like, are, are kids going to watch their favorite players play golf? Like, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it feels was like held it's, in Florida. It feels like it's... And well, that's what I mean, though, is you have to because it's there. But if it's for kids, it's not. And if it's for adults, it's not. Like, and it, it just goes to the same thing I say about the way that games are presented at um, the Scotiabank Arena. It's just... It does, they don't know who they're they're doing this for. Like the it's they say it's for kids, but the references are are so dated that no kid would understand them. So it's it's somewhere lost in the middle, and that's where you start to lose people because kids don't get it, and and older people think it's cheesy. Well, then with regards to the All Star Game too, you you have you don't have the All Stars of that season there. Yeah, right. Like you don't have the best of the best that season. And with your comment on o- Ovi and Crosby as much as they might not want to realize it, they're not the face of the league anymore. No, but you're telling me that neither of them can pull out a pretty cool breakaway challenge shot. The, these are two players who throughout the course of their career have both at times conveniently had injuries right around the all-star game and not gone. I mean, so it's never been high on their priority list. OV. Yes. He's always avoided it, but like Crosby has been hurt many times. I get it. So, I don't know. Yeah, sure. This to me <laughs> honestly felt like Sid and Ovi's goodbye letter to the NHL. This really felt like this was going to be the last time we were going to see them together at an all-star game because we know Ovi always declines. Uh, Ovi was a participant in all events this year, which is so weird. Sid, you know, he had the whole thing with Marner, and then he came out with Ovi. Subban's, like, starstruck and takes a whole five minutes to get a a jersey signed on the ice to show the fans, like, hey, I'm with the two biggest superstars in the NHL, one of the two. And and, um, if you're not if you don't have knowledge about the NHL, which clearly, if you there were there were a couple videos made um, of fans' reactions, you know, name this player, name that player. Nobody knew shit about fuck. Okay, <laughs> nobody could name Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, except for the random seven-year-old who probably has been playing hockey since he since birth. But. I'm not even complaining about the beach. I'm not even like, I liked those events. I appreciated, you know, hockey and hot weather. Uh, I love that we might get an Australian game. We might get an outdoor game in Florida. This is great. It's just so disappointing when all of these superstars cannot show off and they just fuck around on the ice. Like even Mitch, man, you go to the video of him walking down the beach. It goes to him in the arena and he's like, PK's like, do you have what I need? Or you got what I need? Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's like, like some sort of drug deal. <laughs> it's like, what do you need, Mitch? What do you need? <laughs> Just get out with it. It's Lilongo. And then what does he do? The same shit he would do in every single shootout. <laughs> the weakest shot, right? Wait, maybe not to every single because he's had a really good one recently, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Like, oh, 
The only thing I can hope for is that the weather is a little nicer next year for Toronto because while it was uh, lovely in Florida, it was minus 40 in most of Ontario during the All-Star game for those two days. That was insane. I don't know what it was like where you guys are, but it got to, with the wind chill, minus 43 at one point here in Ottawa. So uh, hopefully wow. February 2nd, 3rd, or 3rd, 4th, whenever it is, it will be nicer next year and uh, we can all be there together. That would be fun. Yeah, I was really wondering the layout of how this would happen around Maple Leaf Square, you know, the Scotiabank Arena. Are they going to take it to maybe Exhibition Place and, you know, Rico Coliseum sort of area where they have the the C and E comes in and they use that parking space? Like, I'm just wondering if they're going to go with the way of majority outside of the arena, how they're going to make it in, you know, the metropolis of Toronto. Yeah, I think it depends on what's like, I don't know if they've coordinated with Scotiabank that um, there's no concerts going on. Like, I don't know if it's that far out. Pardon me. I'm drinking club soda here. Smart to do that while hosting. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything going on. That, like, Rico Coliseum or the CNE, like, that makes sense. Just because, like you said, the parking is easier. It's pretty tough to get to the Scotiabank. Uh, yeah, but there's also... A lot of space inside to have other events going on for people that are there, Sky like Greek style stuff. That Ooh. would be cool. Yo, <laughs> the Rogers Center. That'd be put sick. a rink in the Rogers Center. Capacity but, is, you know, almost triple the SBA. Have it they're all. They're just doing the big renovation in it. Isn't it like seventy thousand there? Roof I think they open? lost some of the capacity with the renovations they're doing. Oh, yeah, they lowered it, right. Still. And, and, you know, according to Mike Rupp, this is going to be Matthews' swan song in his final season as a Leaf, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> capacity, 49,282. Boom. Sold out. For First concerts, it's 10,000 to 55,000. Oh, it was, the last time it was sold out was 93? I'm just assuming with Blue Jays World Series. Because I'm but... pretty sure Dead Mouse sold it out. I think Lady Gaga did too last year. Oh my anyway. god. Guns N' Roses performed at Rogers Center 2016, July 16th in front of 48,000 attendees with Billy Talent. Wow. Holy shit. <clears throat> That's crazy. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, we should talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs at least for a little bit here. Since we're almost at an hour, we should close off with this. Um, lots of rumblings going on. The deadline approaches. We're on a bye week, which is pretty lame. Uh, but it's a good chance for Matthews to, to heal up. Things have been, been rumbling, though, around a couple teams. And uh, the way that I want to do this is uh, I want the two of you to try to make a trade. Uh, you are Kyle Dubas and just tell me which, which team I am and I will, I will act as their GM and you can offer me something. And the, the exercise that I'm trying to show off here is uh, a, what the Leafs don't really have and do have to give up and uh, what the market looks like, you know, compared to everybody else, like how easy it's going to be for a GM to just say no and uh, maybe get your hopes down on a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> say uh we're not going to get timo meyer um yeah so what do you think like chicago is a is a target team and like arizona so do you guys maybe want to do those two when you can make a chicken trade and when you can make a like a mccabe and taves trade or something why did you you know not include timo meyer because my trade is about Timo Meyer. Okay, like fine. Make a make a trade offer to me for Timo Meyer. I'll bring up San Jose Cap Friendly. Make a trade. Okay. This is off my, you know, uneducated cap brain that knows barely anything about this. Okay. Willie Vanilli. Willie Villanueva. Yep. Him. Adam Gaudet. Oh, William Villain Villainview or Villeneuve? Yes. Willie Vanilli. Adam Gaudet. Alexander Kerfoot for Timo Meyer. Sharks just no. traded away Magna. 
No. Scared, losing a D. Okay. Either or Jordy Ben Ingval. So Kerfoot Ingval Jordy Ben. I'm rotating out of this, but I want to give them one of our prospects, a defender, a really high tier Marley, like Gaudet, and then a guy who's kind of eating up some of our cap. You're you're taking this too much of uh, what you don't want to give up and what you want to get rid of. <laughs> I'm being greedy. Gonna, <laughs> this is this is my point. Is you want Timo Meyer, you're going to have to spend. You're going to throw that second round pick in, and you're going to throw in a prospect that actually means something. And do not fucking tell me that Pierre Engvall's a prospect. Okay. <laughs> I'm so, about... no, like this is what I'm talking. This is the what I'm trying to prove here with this exercise is you can't just give away the things that you don't want and the things that are taking up gap space and get back Timo Meyer. So the Leafs have a first, a conditional third with the seventh. Right, they don't I have believe. their second. Fifth and sixth for next year, but they have a okay. whole lot in 2025. So maybe I'll give them one of the 2025ers. Okay. Alexander Kerfoot, Willie Vanilli, and I'll even throw in a Gaudet. Come on now. Like it, You're not <laughs> You're not getting rid of I'm Gaudet bad at in this, the trade okay. here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hey, like, maybe he'll like thrive in the sun. What I don't is know. <laughs> What does Willie Vanilli even play? He is uh, um, not Villanova, he's for a trial. defenseman. Yeah. What's what's that mean? He's a defenseman. Defenseman? Oh yeah, here William. Villeneuve. He's a right-handed D. Yeah, and Okay, third. Yeah. Okay. He was a uh, what pick? Drafted uh, 122nd overall. This is the yeah, prospect you're going to give me for Demo Meyer with the second round pick next year and Alexander Kerfoot who's contract is expiring and I don't know if I want to re-sign to this team because I'm trying to get rid of money. Fine. You can even have And Max you're you're Ellis. asking them you're asking them to retain <laughs> salary at that point because Timo Meyer makes six million dollars and the Sharks have no space. So you gotta move at least six million or and they have to or they have to retain. So this oh. this this is what I mean. So is there a realistic something that you would actually part with if you wanted to bring in Timo Meyer to this team, because I don't, I'm not knocking that he wouldn't, he would be useful. Like it's somebody that could definitely bring something to this team, but I just think the drop off once you hit the bottom six is still going to be pretty drastic, even if you bring him in and that's something that needs solving. So by moving out all this, that's, those are potential guys that could fill in there. So Kyle Clifford is very no. valuable. <laughs> no, Beaner, do you have any trades you want to put up here? <laughs> Steph's only giving me garbage. So, since she's on the Meyer train, let me take a stab at Meyer. Okay. So, you are going to get the blunt and never used Swiss Army knife, Alexander Kerfoot. We'll sharpen him for you. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get them all sharpened up for you. Okay. So, Alexander Kerfoot our 2023 first rounder okay lottery protected not that that's going to matter but doesn't matter but yeah just throw it in there our 2024 second rounder okay and i will also throw you tyler voigt Woo! oh that was loud Current- sorry <laughs> <laughs> that was Current no OHL in my head. scoring champion and I will include, where was he here? Kyle Clifford. Um, Alex Steves. Okay. Um, Deal. So I, at that point, you're looking at them retaining at least two and a half million of his six. So just under 50% for that, a first, second Voight, Steves and Kerfoot for 50% retained Timo Meyer and anybody else, or is that it? That's it. That's it. I would say, yeah, 
I think that's realistic. Ooh. It's that's, in, in my mind, that's probably what is going to have to happen for the Leafs to get a Meyer. Just because his cap hit is so low and he's an RFA and he's physical and he scores, like he's he's going to be the most expensive person on the market. And we just saw what Bo Horvat went for. You know, it's I think the market's kind of been set now. So uh I think that's a realistic offer. It's it sucks to have to part with one of these guys, but I think it's to be expected that one of Voigt, Steve's or, you know, Hirvan and somebody's gonna go. Like someone's gonna go because they really want to go for it at the deadline from what we've heard. There's blockbuster in the works. But the trade I was more so thinking of, and I still don't really think they're going to go after Chikrin, but if they did go after Chikrin... Just an aside, I think the reason that they're entertaining the idea of Chikrin is because, unfortunately, Morgan Riley's been underperforming this season, and they do not have any defensemen that are offensively minded other than him. Like, there's some guys that can take some shots, but nobody's really... Justin Hall's been the next best offensive forward, and that really shouldn't be the case. The Jake Muzzin hole, which, you know, Dubas, it pains him without Jake Muzzin, and you know he's going to be looking for a replacement there. Yeah, it's the Jake Muzzin hole, but again, it's like, you, you don't notice that as much if Riley is up to what he was playing last season or the year before, but he's just really been struggling to find his offensive game. Like, his defense hasn't been terrible. It's not been great, but, I mean, he's not been, been like, a you know, unplayable defenseman. It's just the fact that it's taken him this long to find the score sheet as far as goals go. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of secondary assists. It's it, There's not a, a lot of, you know, you're, you're noticing his play setting. Like, I'll give it to him. A couple games ago, he did have a really nice, uh, whether it was the Boston one or the game before that, it was a really nice setup. But I mean, look, we're 50 games in, and it's it's only now that we're noticing him. So, uh, I I think that's why you're seeing the talks around Chikrin heat up after it was. I think a lot of people dismissed it at first as you know why would we need that, but now it's um, we we might need that. Yeah. The same reason people are talking about a goalie now that Matt Murray's struggling, right? Yeah, like I think uh, Gio has been solid. Of course, Timmins has been an unexpected surprise. But Timmins Gio- is great. Yeah, yeah. But uh, neither of these guys were expected to be the one-two punch with Morgan Riley. Um, Riley being our number one guy. And then your backup to Muzzin is Sandine, who has that offensive upside. But I don't know. Timothy Lilligren, man, that shot that he, like I said, he's not afraid to take the shot. He might be the number two guy next to Morgan Riley. Um, You're right. The way he's progressing, but... But make me a trade for Chikrin. So, ideally, I would want to include Lawson Kraus. But okay. that's not realistic in my mind. That that would be, to me, that would be the idea or the definition of a true, true blockbuster, like a trade for Chikrin and Kraus. Yeah. But at this point, we'll do Chikrin and Bukestad. Bukestad's a big body, can play center, can play wing. He can kind of fill in that bottom six role, add a little punch and size down there that we may need. So you are at a total of five and a half million dollars, just so you know. Yep. That's okay because Murray's going to go on long term uh, IR and then we're going to pull him back for playoffs. (laughs) (laughs) That is some wishful thinking, my friend, but I see your point. (laughs) <laughs> um, Murray is 4.6875 though. So it is only enough to hide Chikrin. Oh but yeah. Leafs... But I haven't, we haven't made the trade yet. And as of right now, they have one point, what is it? 1. 1.8 or 1.1 of deadline space. So, um, okay. So what are you moving for Chikrin? So for Chikrin, I don't really know if they would go for, Kerfoot, because he's a couple years, you know, he's he's getting towards the end of his 30s. So, in this deal, I would probably be looking more so, let's say... End of his 20s. An, yeah, that's what I meant. Ignore that age thing. 
Um, <laughs> so let's go Engvall, Anderson. And as much as it pains me to say it, Topi Niemela. Okay. So Engvall, Anderson, Niemela. And then as long as we didn't pull off the Meyer trade, our first round this year, yet again, lottery protected, not that it's going to matter, but yeah, I think if du- even if Dubas traded the first round this year, not lottery protected, and it was for McDavid, people would yell at him just because that's how people are right now. Um, and then our third and fourth rounders in 2025. I think it's that would get you that would get you Chikrin and Bugstad. The thing with I I would love Chikrin and Kraus. The the difference here, Steph, in the price is like Timo Meyer's done at the end of this year. Like his contract's up and he's an RFA. Chikrin is signed until the end of twenty twenty five at four point six million dollars. So it's mm. his contract is insanely good, especially with what the market's at right now. He should be making double that if he was healthy and consistently playing at the level that you know he's capable of Lawson Krauss is signed to the end of 27 at 4.3 million so I don't think they're looking to part with him it looks like he he's kind of going to be one of the consistent ones with with uh, Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz heading into the future there but I I don't know how much they're they're sold on that top three or I, whatever they end up being I think the injury to Nikki Bobby this year has really handcuffed Dubas no kidding yeah, that was somebody that was either going to come in or go out, right? Like it was either you mm-hmm. show him off and he becomes a piece, or he's good and joins the team, but he's unfortunately doing neither. Yeah, yeah. like re- realistically, I wouldn't want to include Niemela in any trade, but if you could get Bukestad and Chikrin, it, like you, you got to give to get, right? You're not going to get what you want for free. No, and I mean, Bukestad's 30. He's up at the end of the year. He only makes 900K. It's a cheap ad. As a, he's a center right wing. It's bolstering your bottom six, which is something that they desperately need. Like, Camp needs some help down there. I'm sorry, especially if you're going to be moving Engvall out. You need to bring somebody in to replace him. So, uh, Bukestad works there. It, yeah, you're, you're spending a lot here. That's something that Leafs Nation isn't used to, especially under Dubas. He's typically been spending low and and getting uh, unexpected W's, but I think this is going to be the first time where we see him move something that people go, oh, but good. I mean, I I don't know how I feel about this. Like, it's going to be one of those. The trade's going to go through and you're going to go, oh, shit, we gave up a lot for this. It'd be the first time since, I mean, the Nick Foligno trade was was kind of that because we hadn't spent a first rounder in a while and and bought somebody at the deadline in a while and I think that was a shocker to everybody, especially when it didn't pan out. So, I mean, that's really the only one in recent memory, at least. Realistically, though, this should be Dubis's chance to show off what he can do with the draft capital or the prospect pool that he's built up. Like he's built up this prospect pool at the same time as trying to take care of all the bad contracts that he was handcuffed with from Lamorello. Exactly. And the the plus side of that is, yeah, you've got all these guys that could potentially come in and join Marner and Matthews down the line. And, and, you know, it's, it's awesome having too many guys to deal with. But the other side of that is you can move some of these guys, right? Like you're never going to be able to fit them all. I've played enough of these simulator games and, and gone seasons deep where I've collected too many of these guys and go, oh shit, like this guy, I have six guys that are all supposed to be first line people, but I can only put three of them on the first line. So I probably should have moved some of these guys a while ago. You know, it's, there's not going to be room for all of them if they're all fantastic. So magic beans, trade them while the value is still imaginary. Now, what if he does something completely less left field as we already imagined, but it's for a goaltender because Murray is not. Thatcher Demko. Hmm. I, I was actually thinking about putting together a proposal for Demko and Shen. Demko and Shen. Why? Did, I don't get Shen only because I think our bottom D is so deep that the only thing that they're missing is a 
like a pair for or substitution for a faltering Riley, or they need to bolster the, the bottom six or the left wing. Like those are kind of the things that I think need addressing. Like the bottom of the D is pretty, pretty deep. No, am I wrong? I agree with you. Um, there's two reasons I in- would include Shen there. One for the nostalgia. Cause I love the guy. Oh yeah. Um, loved him when he was drafted, especially cause he had that world juniors. I remember him fighting against Russia in the world juniors, which you never see. Um, so I've, I've always loved Shen. And then every mainstream sports media talking head out there will always and forever say that the Leafs need a big, strong physical defenseman and they can never have enough defense. But I mean, don't you already have Jordy Ben for that? Like, isn't, isn't Ben kind of your Shen? A game here or there, Shen's a little bit more effective in that role. Yeah. I... Like, I, I get it. I just, I feel like by committee, you have what Shen is going to bring. Like, everybody's kind of bringing an element of that already. Like, I get it. I'm not against it. I just think it's it's not where I would spend just because there are th- so many things that could be improved. Like, after watching Boston and watching Tampa, it's like, I'm not going to count the Boston game right before the, the All-Star break and the bye week for much because, like, nobody was mentally in that game. They were so checked out. They were as checked out as their bags were. So, like, I I would just say that the the reason Arizona makes sense, like you brought up, is you've got either uh, Kraus or uh, Bukestad. So you can bring in somebody that's either top six or bottom six, plus a defenseman. Or you go over to um, Chicago or San Jose or, I don't mean, I don't know who else outside of that, Vancouver even and try to find a combination of a top winger and a goalie or a top winger and a defenseman. So <sighs> I'm so excited to see what he does, but it's like, it's just that the waiting game, you know, we can all speculate all we want, but nobody's going to actually nail what Dubas is going to do. And if any of you do, please, please send me the, your prediction. <laughs> and I, I swear, Mike, the fanatic, if you nail this, <laughs> but you have to send it baby. now. Yeah, you gotta like send me the the like timed screenshot, you know, that shows you tweeted it like whenever and yada yada. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna buy week here. So the Leafs are back Friday and Saturday against the Columbus Blue Jackets. That's gonna be so exciting. Um, the Blue Jackets aren't great. So what do you want to see from the Leafs out of these two games? Matthews is still out. Uh, do you want to see Murray start the first or the second game here? Like. If he's healthy. I want to see a Joseph Wall win. Yeah, yeah. What? now that I say that, actually, I totally forgot about this. What is the update on, on Matt Murray? Is he... Um, no it update. It doesn't say he's on I, injured reserve. I think Wall will be backing up Samsonov. Um, and I think Wall is going to get the Saturday night game. Um, man, the guy hasn't... You know, he's 13-1-0 on the season, 9-30, won the AHL top honors. Give him the shot. Who cares? Murray, sit down. This guy is the next. This is the future of the Leafs right now, the brick wall. And I hope it everything goes well for him. Um, Johnny Gaudreau oh. better not break out first the Leafs here. <laughs> Uh, just an update here from nine hours ago. This is from Fansided. Uh, oh, updated one minute ago. Thanks, David uh, Corcoran. Wow. So, um, as per Cap Friendly, the Leafs have recalled only Pontus Holmberg from the Toronto Marlies. They sent both Joseph Wall and Haunt- Pontus Holmberg to the Marlies l- last week during the break uh, so they could get some action over the weekend. So, the fact that they only brought Holmberg back means that Murray is probably good to go this weekend. Her cap friendly wool was called up on emergency loan today. Today. <clears throat> yeah. Well, they I did. don't know then. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? So I, I think it'll be really interesting to see over the next little while as well a lot of the quote unquote paper transactions that happen with the Leafs. Yeah. To try to accumulate as much extra cap space as you can. Now that's. 
it, realistically, that might not even be possible with how deep they are into the LTIR pool. But it, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see because everybody and their brother has been saying that some massive blockbuster is coming. Yeah, and I feel like that isn't usually the case, right? Like people aren't usually saying that Dubas is is going to do something big. It's usually a lot of the the same talk of you know he's going to everybody else is going to do something big. He's going to get the thing out of left field that everybody forgot about that'll make an impact and he'll spend low on it and he'll maybe spend like some dude that was never going to play for the Marlies and a third rounder for this guy that's going to play on the third line. It's going to be fantastic. And that's usually it. Yeah. The first time we've been hearing from everywhere for weeks and, you know, it's always Duba spotted with this GM and that GM and at this game and that game, like I have no idea what this guy's cooking up. I mean, Mark Giordano was a very nice surprise, uh, especially getting, you know, a number one defense defender and a Norris winner at that. So it makes me wonder, you know, who's out there that's a Toronto boy aging, looking for their last years in the NHL? Is that going to be a trend? I don't know. It just, it's been a trend so far with Dubas. Uh, is that going to continue or are we actually going to make a splash with someone who may stick with the Leafs long term or next two or three years? I hope so. If it, if it makes them go far. Yeah. I mean, is Ryan O'Reilly from Toronto? <laughs> is he Canadian? <laughs> um, he is actually, Canadian. Yeah. Also, Bo Hovart or Horvat. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hovart, what am I saying? <laughs> He's from London, eh? So all that well, speculation of him coming to Toronto ended. But yeah, that would have been a... Well, not only that. So we didn't talk about this. So Horvat goes to the Islanders. Uh, and then there was this weird period where everyone's like, is Lou going to flip him? Like, why did the Island... Like, I get why the Islanders brought in somebody that can score. But are they actually going for it? Like, they're barely fighting for wild card right now like it's not it's not even a lock that they're going to be in the playoffs and it's un un luke un un lu like uh <laughs> t- that was a, a horrible attempt un lu like to um spend on somebody like this like even he said the which is my favorite quote my favorite lu quote ever when asked how much it was he said it's for too much money and for too long <laughs> Yeah, why why would he say that? <laughs> because he thinks that everybody now is overpaid. He doesn't want anybody to have a number over 40. Like, he's crazy. So, I get it for the Islanders. They need somebody who can score, but I just I don't get why they're the ones spending. So then everybody was speculating, you know, is he going to flip this before the deadline? And then it comes out eight times eight and a half. He's, he's going to be on Long Island for <laughs> a long time. And everybody else went, Lou, what the hell? It's like you just everybody was fighting over this and you just walked in and took it and and just said, Okay, we're just gonna throw this in this in the safe for safekeeping. Thanks, guys. It's like he just took the the biggest name off the board next to Timo Meyer. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he did end up flipping it. You think it's even still like a sign and trade? He can get more in return now because he's locked up. He's locked up eight and a half times eight. That's not a crazy deal, but like, it, it, it's not like Lou's retaining anything on that. Like, he's going to have to. No team can take that on without moving salary to him. I he's at a point in his career where every single thing he does doesn't matter because he's, he's 80, not going to be by there. The way. Right. <laughs> he's he, he's not going to be there when when it comes time to pay the piper. Right. He's not going to. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an eight-year contract. He he might not be signing the last check on that. We'll Lou just say bought, that. Honestly, like Lou got punked in a sense where he bought him for his best year in a contract year. Like you're you bought me. I don't know. You're staying mediocre at best in my mind. <laughs> like you're not improving to me. Um, losing that prospect, uh, Ratty and. You know, even a, what was it, a first rounder, uh, conditional. First Bolivier and Atu Ratu, or, yeah, so. Atu Ratty? Um, yeah. It's apparently it, it's pronounced. It's actually pronounced Ratu. 
Yeah, it's pronounced Atu Ratu. Oh, sorry. I I know. Sorry, Ratu. It's weird. <laughs> sorry, it's not weird. It's a different language. That doesn't make it weird. It's yeah, just it's different not weird. Just... Uh, so Bolivier a first and Atu Ratu for Bohor Vet. So that's a, a late first, mid second round prospect. Somebody who's locked up. That's you know, basically, uh, I guess, comparable to Kerfoot for us if we're moving something out as a, you know, middle six, three and a half to four and a half mil, and then a first. So that's kind of, it's telling for what the Leafs would have to spend. Um, you're looking at a prospect, a first, and, and somebody that's uh, that's serviceable in the NHL, who's not making too much money. No more beards, no more jewelry, no long hair. You're locked in. I don't think Bo Horvat ever had any of that, so I don't think he really cares. He had kind of a... Well, he has facial hair. Uh, Lou yeah. doesn't allow any, right? No, none. More of stress than anything. They gotta wear uh, suits everywhere and all that. Anyway. So, the other one that was locked up, uh, Strom with the Washington Capitals. Five times five for him. So, lots of uh, uh, symmetrical contracts. What was it? Five times five and a half and eight times eight and a half? <laughs> yeah. Um, finally, you know, finding a home after the, our, uh, the Rangers the, boot him out. No, the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks. Other Strom, uh, right. Yeah. That was the other Strom. Didn't give him the qualifying offer. And then he signed a one year deal, 3.5 with Washington and they liked him. So, you know, and I, I like him there too. I think he's a good fit with that team. They also just locked up Sonny Milano for, uh, what was it? Three times 1.9 or something like that, which uh, it's nice to see. I mean, we talked about this with the capitals, how there's not a lot for the future. Like they've kind of just been looking towards the next 20 minutes with Ovi. And that seems to be as far as they've ever looked. So now it seems like they're, they're starting to build outwards. You know, he's 38. They got to move on. And uh, it looks like they're, they're kind of solidifying the outer rim and they got to maybe make a move once ovi has gone for a big name. Because I don't think they're going to draft one with the way that they, they play. They're always kind of middle of the pack, unless they get really lucky. Yeah, they're going to be yeah. like the like the Wild, right? For the longest time, the Minnesota Wild were stuck in that kind of mushy middle. They were good enough not to draft well, but bad enough not to really get anywhere. Yeah. And how did they end up with Kaprizov? They brought him over from the K or something? Oh, hold on, Beaner. Your it says your browser's stopping you from recording. So, I think we'll we'll call it at that. Uh, we'll pick back up after the um, games this weekend. Tuesday now. Um, Friday, Friday. We all good for Friday. Friday. We can, or do we want to do Thursday and then Saturday night? Does that make more sense? I don't Tuesday, know. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Let's do that. Tuesday, sure. Thursday, Saturday. We'll see you then. Thank you all for being here. Love you. Good night. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Leafs Late Night, your night of post game podcast. Available after every game on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and more. Hey, Marty, congrats on the uh, publishing deal again.